I can hear it in your head. I've taken too much liberty with the translation. But no, I really haven't, y'all. I really haven't. I want to talk to you about this princess dress. Um, you have probably heard it called what? Coat of many colors. Any other? Technicolor dream coat. Good, yes. Joseph has a musical, so you know his story. Um, but the term here, katonet passim, it can be translated in a lot of different ways. It means more literally a really long robe with long skirts and long sleeves. Sometimes the word passim is used for colorful or striped. So we don't really know exactly what's in mind here, except, except there is one other place where this phrase shows up in the Hebrew Bible. One other place only. The Katonit Passim comes in the story of Tamar, who is King David's daughter. In 2 Samuel, Tamar is wearing a Katonit Passim, and the author goes out of his way to tell us that this is the traditional clothing of a princess. This is Joseph's sparkly rainbow princess dress. And you're going to have to pry that out of my Hebrew reading hands. This is why it's so important for your pastors to learn Greek and Hebrew so you can maneuver around in this. Because our English translators knew that. They knew that was the only other place that this word shows up. And still they chose robe of many, a long robe with sleeves or something like that. How boring, right? This is a princess dress. Thank you. And when we see it on Tamar, it is ripped as well. It's worth noting that Tamar, King David's daughter, the princess in 2 Samuel, wearing her traditional princess dress, rips her own dress after being sexually assaulted by her brother. We won't go into that whole story, but I think it is a connection between Joseph and Tamar, a connection that is mirrored in our own world between queer kids, gender queer kids, and women who are abused and discarded that we see all the time. And maybe this is one of the reasons that all of my colleagues who are women in ministry are firm advocates and celebrators of the queer community because we have this connection deep in the blood of our scripture even, and why maybe some of our male pastor friends have a harder time. So not grateful for the reason for the connection, but grateful to be able to see our common humanity in the face of uh, oppression. So, traditional clothing of a princess that Joseph is wearing. And Joseph's father, Jacob, lets Joseph be Joseph. That's a good message for Father's Day, I think. He gives him, he makes him this, this rainbow princess dress and lets him wear it proudly. Now, we can't, as Reverend Rice or Minister Rice said last week, we can't speculate too much about biblical characters' sexuality or gender identity. We don't know. They're not here. That's not fair. But we know from Scripture and from rabbinical interpretation early on that Joseph is undeniably strange. He's different than his brothers. He's queer. He's feminine. He wears his princess dress, but that's not all. If you look into the writings of the rabbi in Midrash, we hear that, that Joseph was switched at birth. Joseph was switched at birth with uh, his cousin Dina, who was supposed to be in Joseph's mother Rachel's womb, but Leah, Rachel's sister, felt compassion for Rachel, who had not yet had a son. And Leah prayed to God that Rachel would have the son. And as the rabbis tell it, Dina and Joseph are switched in utero, right? A gender transition in utero. This is a queer baby before we even get to know him. Later on, the rabbis talk about Joseph being like a youth, being beautiful, even though he was 17. They talk about him wearing makeup on his eyes and prancing around and curling his hair and looking like his mother. That's what all mothers want to hear, I know, that your kids look like you. His mother, of course, had died in childbirth with his little brother. And this may have been one of the reasons that Jacob loved Joseph so much. 
Joseph reminded him of Rachel, his most beloved wife, the one he waited and worked extra years to get to marry. Do you all remember that story? All these stories are connected. Maybe that's why Jacob loved Joseph so much, because his mama, he reminded him of his mama. Or maybe Jacob loved Joseph so much because he reminded him of himself. You remember Jacob's story? Jacob is the younger brother of Esau, the twins. Esau is the big manly hairy one. Joseph, I mean, excuse me, Jacob is the beautiful, fair, soft-skinned mama's boy, even when they are children, the trickster. The one that is strange, that is different, that steals the blessing. Gosh, there's so much good stuff here. We can't get into all of it. But in any case, whether it was his love for Rachel or the way that he saw himself in Joseph, Jacob let Joseph be Joseph. He gave him the princess dress. He wore it with pride. And we don't know when the princess dress was given or for how long he had it. But we know in our story today, Joseph is now 17. Joseph is the favorite, and his brothers have started to resent him. They could not speak peaceably with him. Joseph is becoming a little too confident, talking about dreams where he is clearly ruling over his brothers, right? And maybe his father Jacob sees this and remembers his own pain and estrangement from his brother, from his father. Maybe he sees a part of his own trauma in Joseph. There's this really beautiful quote from a novel I read by Madeline Miller. She says, But perhaps no parent can truly see their child. When we look, we see only the mirror of our own faults. So maybe Jacob starts to see, as Joseph grows, the mirror of what he thinks are his own faults. Maybe he wants to protect him from his brothers. Maybe he wants him to grow up. Maybe it's time for him to become more manly. Whatever the case may be, whatever Jacob's reasoning, he sends him out to his brothers, but he loses him in the end. He sends him out to his brothers thinking, it's time for you to be like them. It's time for you to assimilate. And they beat him. They see him coming from the distance in his rainbow princess dress. And they almost kill him. In some kind of moment of compassion, they decide to sell him instead. Compassion or perhaps greed, right? They said, where is the prophet if we kill him? We can make this work to our own advantage. They then proceed to erase him from the family. They scheme to fake his death, as we read. The princess dress, ripped and bloodied, is returned to their father. They could not let Joseph be Joseph. And I think that every queer kid and every parent of a queer kid and every ally of queer friends knows some version of this story, many versions of this story that keep playing out over and over again in our own society, or at least the fear of this story being theirs. But God is with him. There's a long saga going forward that we can't get into all the details of, but God is with Joseph. God is with Joseph as he is, even as he is sold, as he is accused, as he is imprisoned, as he is then released and finally elevated. He becomes the official dream interpreter, that dreamer that was uh, sneered upon, is the official dream interpreter for the Pharaoh. He becomes the number two in command of all of Egypt. I mean, talk about a rags to riches story. God is with him. And years later, years later, when there is a famine in the lands, Joseph, Joseph gets to have his dramatic coming out scene with his family. His family comes to Egypt. They've all but forgotten about Joseph. And they come face to face with the brother that they have erased or tried to erase, right? They don't recognize him. But there he is. He's no longer a bullied kid. He's a grown ruler. And I wonder if his Egyptian garb, 
didn't look a lot like his ketonet passim. You've seen the pictures of the Egyptian garb, the long robes, colorful, their uh, use of eye makeup, and just a different way of being. And I think it's beautiful that Joseph already had all of that in him from the beginning. I wonder if he looked a little bit like himself. When they meet again, they don't recognize him, and the power is reversed. There's a whole dramatic story about how Joseph reveals that it is, in fact, him. But we'll save that for another sermon. The main point is now, when he has something to offer them, when he has power to share, his family loves him. But he always had something to offer. He always had power to share. And Joseph, despite all of, the, um, all of the reasons he had to imprison his family, to say no, to get his revenge, despite all of that, if anyone had reason, it's him, right? Despite all of that, he interrupts that cycle of violence and love breaks through. He uses his position of power to stop the hatred, the violence, the, um, the trauma that has been rampant in his family from the beginning of their history. We can flip back a few pages. And finally, his brothers can see him in the fullness of himself in his Egyptian ketonet pasim, Regal, generous, gracious, and now they let Joseph be Joseph. He is reconciled with his family. He is reunited with his father after so many years of him thinking he was dead. It's a beautiful story. Unlikely in real life, right? But beautiful and something for us to aspire to because there are so many Josephs in our lives. There are so many little Josephs that we love. And if there's any message from this text, I think it is that we can let Joseph be Joseph. We can see the truth of what is in our children, in our friends, and each other, and embrace that. See the value that is there even without all the trappings of power. Let him wear the princess dress proudly. Let him wear the eyeliner or the combat boots. Let them dream big. Let all those kids who are different than us be exactly who they are and see it as God's gift. Use what privilege we have to step in and protect them, not by making them into our expectations, but by accepting and seeing the value of their true selves. Sometimes our fear of others comes from something that we're afraid of in ourselves, like I suspect might have been happening for Jacob, Joseph's dad. And so the other message is, don't be afraid of who you are, your quirks, your uniqueness, your dreams and gifts. You are worthy of your dreams, even if those around you don't see it. You are. Let's you be you. Let Lisa be Lisa. Let Jonathan be Jonathan. Let Natalie be Natalie. Let Charlene be Charlene. Let Lance be Lance. This is the good news of the gospel, y'all. Don't let the world convince you that violence and revenge and retribution is the only way. Sometimes that's all our imaginations can see, right? They started it. This is what happened, and this is my justified response. No, that's not the only way. Let Joseph, that dreamer, inspire you. Interrupt the cycle of power, the cycle of uh, violence, the cycle of revenge with grace, not because it's deserved, because it isn't. Interrupt the cycles of our world by being your full self, by being standing in your truth, in your uniqueness, in your queerness, and loving anyway, extending reconciliation anyway. 
This is what Joseph teaches us today, and this is what Joseph's uh, descendant, Jesus, who we worship and follow, teaches us every day, right? This is what Jesus does best. He steps into a violent world and says, peace. He enters a world of people who want to kill him and doesn't fight back. He shows us another way. He gives us a way to reimagine, to dream a new world. Jesus, that dreamer who calls us to follow him. Beloveds, may we all be like Joseph's. May we see them in our lives. May we see them in ourselves. May we protect and uplift them. May we all be dreamers. May we protect the dreamers around us. May we interrupt our world with love and grace and truth that is already inside each one of us, each one of you. May we follow Jesus as we enter into our world with grace and peace. And maybe a rainbow princess dress. Amen.